My name is Ray Kozlowski from the Political Science Department at Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy at the University at Albany. I'd like to welcome you all to this forum on state government immigrant policy and thank the Rockefeller Institute of Government here hosting us, hosting our event, and also my college for co-sponsoring. And finally, and not least of course, is the support from the MacArthur Foundation that makes this event possible. As Congress fails uh, to enact comprehensive immigration reforms, the Obama administration is attempting to put in place elements of immigration reform through administrative actions. Um, but as federal policy making has in many ways remained in a kind of suspended animation for about two decades now, the states, many states, have enacted laws that focus on immigration law enforcement, such as the Arizona law requiring police to check immigration status of those detained. And then there are other states and local initiatives that focus more on recruiting foreign students and high-skilled migrants to support economic development, um, charging in-state tuition uh, to unauthorized uh, students at state universities, as well as uh, offering state-funded financial assistance, the state-level DREAM Acts, as they're, they're known. But the bottom line is, is that states must deal with all of the practical issues of health care, of uh, economic development, of housing, for all of their residents, including immigrants. So if federal charges, uh, sorry, changes in policy do happen, it's the state governments who have to deal with the consequences of those changes. Now, we, for those of you who have joined us, now we've been having a roundtable discussions here with academics and policy analysts to think about some of these issues and, and, and talk about potential research projects. That's what we academics love the most. But now we have an opportunity to hear from the policymakers who've been in the thick of it in terms of developing new immigrant policies and putting them into place. We have Cesar Perales, who is the New York uh, State Secretary of State, who, again, as we learned before, and, and uh, just to inform those of you who have come, has been central to standing up the uh, Office for New Americans, which is located in the State Department, and has become a major vehicle for naturalizing New Americans and a whole host of other activities. We also have with us Marcos Crespo, who is New York State Assembly Member, Chair of the Assembly uh, Puerto Rican Hispanic Task Force, and also Chair of the Task Force on New Americans. So we've got the executive branch and the legislative branch here passing the laws and putting them into action here in New York, working uh, to support New Americans. And we'll have two presentations, about 15 minutes each. Uh, first, we'll hear from Secretary Perales on protecting immigrants from immigrant assistance service fraud. Um, and then... I'm, I'm going to vary. The you're time. going to vary. You see, this is what happens at uh, all of the academic conferences, too. They said, I know that's in the program, and I'm changing the title. <laughs> that's fine. Absolutely fine. I, I will just ramble. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> I'll join you. <laughs> and then we'll hear from Assemblymember Crespo. Um, and then... Uh, that what he had was immigrant integration and epic of anti-immigration policies. That's pretty wide, Something though. like that. Yeah. That's something like, well, that's pretty wide. That gives you a lot of latitude, all right? Exactly. And uh, after our presentations, we'll open up the floor for questions and answers. So, Secretary Perales, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is uh, this on? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, uh, I really did mean I'm going to ramble. Let me tell you what, what, what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, how I, I got here, and by that I mean how I got into this room, into this discussion. Um, I've uh, been in and out of government for uh, many years, uh, more than I will tell, uh, and uh, have spent a great deal of my life as a litigator, as a civil rights lawyer. 
Uh, I uh, was the founder of something originally called the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, which is now called Latino Justice Pearl Dev. And uh, <clears throat> I say that to, to explain my perspective and um, how it is that I became uh, Secretary of State and uh, got an opportunity to create the Office for New Americans. Uh, historically, I think uh, governments have traditionally had what I would call constituency offices. That is, I remember way back when uh, the Latinos demanded that there be a Latino person they could go to in whatever government I was in. It was either the state or the city, and there were uh, a variety of constituency offices that we've had. And I, I think their primary focus was to uh, ensure that the chief executive knew what was going on in that community, got invited to the parades, uh, attended the festivals, and uh, read uh, a lot of proclamations at the uh, appropriate event. Um, as a, a lawyer who, who was engaged in litigating against uh, governments, uh, usually state or local governments, uh, I, um, I learned very disappointingly that uh, the power of uh, state and local government was often used to, in a way that was antithetical to the uh, well-being of newcomers to our country. Uh, uh, to put it nicely, there was anti-immigrant policies that, that I would litigate. Um, often it was the right of uh, immigrant day laborers to, to seek employment because many jurisdictions banned them and said it would be illegal for them to engage in that kind of uh, activity, which we successfully argued was actually free speech. Um, and then there were places like Hazleton, Pennsylvania, where um, they passed a, a series of ordinances that basically said um, anyone who rents an apartment to someone who can't prove they are documented is committing a crime. It was, it was that kind of, um, of local legislation that was being passed. And so I saw government exercising its power against immigrants, few governments exercising what power they had on behalf of immigrants. And so when um, the son of my former boss, Governor Mario Cuomo, uh, got elected, uh, he called and said, uh, would you come back and um, serve as Secretary of State? And I said, well, it depends on what the job entails. And we had a series of discussions. And um, one of the first issues I brought up was I said I wanted to create uh, an office for new Americans that would not be just a constituency office, but something that uh, would actually help immigrants to integrate into our state. And it's something he understood. Uh, he understood it very quickly and understood what I was talking about. And I said, we're going to need some state money. Uh, he, I think he frowned for a while, but, <laughs> but he ultimately um, agreed that we would find state money to do this. And it was he, actually, who was very much engaged in the idea of helping people to, uh, to become citizens. I was more for anybody who wants to learn English, we ought to provide an opportunity to learn English. And he counted with anybody who wants to be a citizen ought to get assistance to be a citizen. And, and, and the other thing we, we said we would invest in would be ensuring that these immigrants, these newcomers, would have an opportunity to uh, start their own businesses, because we knew so many immigrants wanted to start uh, their own businesses. Uh, we, we were not as good and have not been as good about get, helping immigrants get jobs, frankly. But we've done, um, we've, we've invested a great deal in helping uh, immigrants to, to start their own businesses. So uh, it, it's that perspective 
that I think makes what New York State does a little bit different, uh, perhaps more aggressive. We ha I, I think you may have heard from uh, Laura that we've got uh, 27 offices throughout the state. They uh, are all teaching English to large numbers of people, um, using all kinds of new technology to help people pass the uh, citizenship exam. Um, we just announced, and the governor did this himself uh, this week, that we're going to try to use cell phones to reach uh, farm workers and other folks who are in remote areas to learn English. So that we're experimenting, we're, we're trying lots of different things, but I think we have consistently said we're going to use whatever power, whatever money we can get out of our state budget to act affirmatively on behalf of immigrants, to do what we can to integrate immigrants into our society. Uh, I mean, it's not perfect. It's still a relatively small amount of money. I don't think it's more than six or seven million dollars that we spend a year, but it's real money. Um, and, and we uh, do a variety of things. Uh, we responded uh, not as quickly as New York City, because New York City uh, was in a much better financial situation to respond to the Central American kids that were coming in. But uh, there were actually more children going into Long Island than there were into the city of New York. And we could get absolutely no support from local governments there. So I turned to a lot of um, the, the foundations that had helped me when I was at the Latino Justice on Immigrant Rights work. And uh, they responded, and together, under the leadership of uh, Steve Choi of uh, the Immigration Coalition, we put together a good package uh, and engaged a lot of the local agencies. And with less money than New York City has, we're trying real hard to try to reach uh, as many of the kids that, uh, that are facing deportation on Long Island. So the fact that we had an office um, helped us to respond to, to that crisis, a crisis that obviously continues. But the point is that uh, our attitude is we're not a constituency office. We are going to make a difference in the lives of immigrants who come to, to New York, and I think we are doing that. So with that, uh, I'll let uh, Marcos uh, take over. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and a little intimidating to think you know about something, but sit in a room with, a, with folks who, who, are, who know the nuances and details. So if I look a little afraid <laughs> sitting on this side of the table, bear with me. Um, first of all, let me tell you this. I am, this is my uh, sixth year in office. Um, I've been in Albany. I first came to Albany as an intern in 2003 in the New York State Assembly. Uh, my first, that was my first exposure at the age of 23 to government um, and, and state government and policy. Before that, I grew up in a household of laborers. I'm a painter by trade. I spent most of my youth on a scaffold or on a, or a job site or a construction site or, uh, or painting somebody's home or office. And, and that was home to me and that was, that was my comfort zone. Um, certainly wasn't wearing a suit or having policy discussions. Um, but I'm the son of, an, of, of, my father was an undocumented immigrant when he first arrived. Um, he's from Lima, Peru. He was a merchant marine, um, traveled quite a bit in one of the ships, and in one of those travels decided to stay. Um, it was a, a life-risking endeavor that he took, uh, but it was all meant for all the stories that brings us here today, right? That, that, that desire to provide for something better for your family. My father was the oldest of 12 brothers and sisters, and he, uh, at a, at a, since the age of seven, had to go out and, and, and try and help the family. Uh, they were very poor in Peru. And so for him, work was a natural thing to do, and seeking opportunities was the right thing to do for his family. That's a story that's shared by thousands and millions of people 
um, who and, and who are the population that I think we're now referring to. And it's been the case for so long. Um, maybe the, the, the geographic region where many of these immigrants originate from has changed over the years, uh, but the sentiment, the need, and the desire to find something better um, has not. Um, and that's why these issues, now that I'm in this position, become so important to me, because I've lived it, I see it in my family, I see it in my community. Politically speaking, I'll dare say this, for me, it's not an, an, an easy thing to discuss. I represent now a community um, that while I have a, a large Latino community, it's mostly Puerto Rican. And there are some within the Puerto Rican community who have not been very open uh, to many of these issues because their sentiment is, well, we're citizens. We're not impacted in the same way. And because of the economic needs that so many Americans are facing, so many New Yorkers are facing, even those uh, hard, middle class, working class families, um, that rhetoric that comes up when we discuss things like uh, Dream Act, where they say, well, there's not enough funding going to working citizens' families, so why are we doing this for, for this category? Um, there are some in my own community who feel that, that way and, and share that sentiment and start to question why I'm prioritizing some of these other initiatives. My answer to them is this. Not only do I tell them my own personal story, but I also remind folks um, constantly about the economic and social contributions of immigrants in the state of New York and in this country. I remind folks that this is not a population who takes, but a population who gives. I remind them of the uh, over half a billion dollars in state taxes that we get from Im undocumented New Yorkers who do pay their taxes. Um, and so we, you know, I, I just, there's a moral argument, there's an economic argument as to why the right thing to do is to service and cater to the needs of, of these immigrant communities and these immigrant populations throughout the state of New York. And now the issue is becoming more important to more people because those are not just concentrated now in New York City or in, or in you know, generally known uh, minority or immigrant communities. We're talking about almost every corner of the state having tangible populations uh, representing those that, uh, that are seeking status. So um, there's a lot more interest, I think, and openness from members to discuss some of these issues, but there's difficulty as it relates to funding that's required uh, because there's so many priorities and, and, and everybody's pulling in different directions. Um, with that as a sort of landscape, uh, one of the first bills I introduced when I got elected was uh, the Immigrant Service Enforcement Act. Um, the quick version of the background on that, when I was a staffer, I remember Assemblyman Brodsky and Senator, then Senator Schneiderman introduced similar versions of the bill. Um, I've, they were both at the time uh, running for Attorney General of the state, and, I, and they both announced their intentions with that bill, and I think it was a way to portray what their platform was about, more so than, than I think they envisioned seeing that policy effort through. But to me, it was an important issue because um, n nothing affects immigrant uh, immigrants in general, immigrant New Yorkers, more than the lack of access to quality legal services to ensure uh, that their one shot at achieving status is 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 being uh, you know carried out and, and assisted by proper legal services and not someone with who has the intentions of simply defrauding them. We saw that. I saw that day in and day out. It, be, it in in my community it was something that people talked about and just knew it was part of life. Like there was nothing you can do about it. And I refused to accept that. So I took the concept of that bill, introduced it, tweaked it work with the secretary from day one and took us some time to get to a point where we were all uh, in the right place. The first version that passed both houses uh, was vetoed by the governor, but to his credit, to the administration's credit, they, they were committed to seeing the bill through and to, and to addressing this issue. And, and we were able to tweak it and with it, um, not only codified uh, for the future of the state, the Office of New Americans, uh, but we finally outlined very specifically what are the rules and what are the uh, responsibilities of, of immigrant service providers, non-attorney immigrant service providers, creating new categories of penalty for those that commit systemic fraud, and create and, and basically a, a created a, a mechanism to, um, to really put a stop to that revolving door of those that even were able to get in trouble but then came back and nothing's really stopped them uh, from getting back into the field. Uh, with it also was a promotion of the hotline and and other initiatives to really educate um, immigrants about where to seek services and how to verify uh, the type of services that they're getting. Um, that was really an important piece of legislation for me, and, and but not certainly not the only one that's that, that's out there uh, that we're looking to to promote. Just one correction: I'm no longer the chair of the Task Force on New Americans. You will hear an announcement. Uh, don't want to get ahead of the speaker on this. I don't know if they they put it out, but uh, one of my colleagues will be taking over uh, the task force. Um, and it's great because it, it, it's a, more diversity in terms of those that are getting involved on in these issues that affect not just Latino communities, but all communities. Um, and so we're excited about that. There are, 
this budget reflected, I believe, for the first time, a, a, a real commitment and a stronger commitment to a lot of these issues. Not, uh, the Secretary alluded to some of the funding that was put in place. There were monies in there, not only uh, to expand the services of the owners, but also um, some funding for education services through the regions for those unaccompanied minors um, in various districts throughout the state. Uh, there were resources for, for example, I was able to assist in getting monies for the Albany Law School image Immigrant project. I believe I got the right name for the. There's so many groups. Uh, you know, we've been talking more and more about expanding uh, the uh, funding for legal services. We know that that is imperative. Um, we've and we're looking at a number of other things. We have um, there's legislation I'm developing now that will allow the state of New York. And this is a, this is happening now in a couple of other states. And and we want we want to bring that to New York. Um, this new initiative that I don't want to get too far ahead on um, that we're looking to to draft is we're, we're building the consensus support around it, but it would it would help us prevent unnecessary deportations um, for those that are already involved in in some uh, criminal procedures. Um, it's going to have a tremendous impact, but I think it's just a logical approach to to that problem. Um, there are bills like. Keith, I know Keith Wright, Assemblyman Wright, has a legislation similar to California that would allow someone who graduates from law school to be able to practice law. In the state of New York, we're looking at bills that would allow for undocumented Im uh, immigrants to be able to b purchase insurance through the health exchange. There's just so many ideas out there um, that we that we want to champion and support um, and move forward with. And, and one of the things that I hope we can do in the legislature is begin to present some of these in the form of a legislative package, similar to what we do. I mean, we just did a domestic violence package. We're going to do a women's package. I believe that the state of New York should take it further. The legislature should have an immigrant legislative day, uh, uh, a package of bills addressing these issues to continue to build that support uh, across the state. But we have our challenges. We still don't have a DREAM Act, um, or a DREAM Fund, for that matter. Um, we have significant political challenges as it relates to the Senate. And it's truly unfortunate um, that the needs of these students has been used as the line in the sand on, on, on political posturing. Um, the ineffectiveness of the federal government to address a lot of these issues is because of this extremist politics that have taken hold, um, that it's not based on, on fact or, or data or morality. It's really just extreme posturing for political purposes. And it's hurt uh, uh, millions of people who do nothing more than than, than build the fabric of, of our society and, and our states and, and, our, and for our country. Um, I hope that the state of New York can move past that and do that much more and continue to show that we can do our part as a state um, to speak to the inaction in the federal government. Something as simple as getting a federal waiver from first state ed on the testing of L students, um, it's hurting us. And in this conversation about student achievement, um, you know, we, 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 we're presenting inaccurate information. Um, it's just completely illogical to take a child who just arrived, who just sat down in a classroom, maybe listening to this language for the first time, who maybe has some educational challenges from even in their native language, and to say, here's an exam, and based on this result, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna to create education policy. It, it's, it's just illogical. It's just wrong. And, and fortunately, we're, we're waiting on this federal waiver. And uh, Senator Gillibrand has, has stepped up to the plate and really pushed for that as well. Um, so there's a lot of these types of, of initiatives that are out there. I, my staff, they're going to hate me for this. They always prepare these beautiful statements. I, I don't believe in reading statements. If you can't say something from the heart, you shouldn't say it at all. Um, and, and to and, and just to piggyback on something else the Secretary said, the City of New York has really led the way in showing that there are ideas that make sense, that are workable, that are respectful to all, um, even if you disagree with some positions. Um, the municipal IDs, I believe, to be a game changer in, in giving so many New Yorkers, uh, in the City of New York particularly, the opportunity to feel comfortable, to come forward, to go be active in, as parents in their children's education. It's like we, you know, we do one thing, but then the other hand, what is that expression? The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. You know, we pay for a primary and secondary education for these students, but then we make it difficult for their families to be a part of their education when they're, when they're scared to even walk into a building. Um, I believe the municipal IDs is a, is a simple way and an easy way of creating something that speaks to all New Yorkers, but allows for some remedy for those folks to feel more comfortable, get more involved. I would hope um, that more cities across the state 
um, and municipalities uh, begin to, to, to use this model and expand on it. Um, can't wait to get my card. But um, <laughs> it's been a waiting list. Um, but there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of energy around this. I believe there's a lot of passion around these issues. I believe that more and more members are starting to prioritize this uh, in the same way that income inequality is no longer just a New York City or an urban issue. Um, upstate members, Republican members, the issue of poverty is affecting everyone. I think in the same light, um, the, the, the demographic changes, the population changes, um, and the contributions of immigrant New Yorkers who have been at the forefront of starting new businesses, um, creating new industries, really should be taken into account. And if we're honest about helping all, and if we're honest about fixing our economic conditions, I think a large uh, part of that speaks to the way in which we not only address the needs of, uh, uh, of this community, but also empower them uh, to be a part of that uh, economic renaissance that we have to continue to create. Something as simple, uh, I have a bill on this too, but I'm promoting my bills, is uh, kitchen incubators. Immigrant communities uh, particularly have tremendous opportunities as it relates to food industries. Catering, you know, there's, there's all this need for and, and desire for very specific types of catering services. Um, and, and we have a plethora of individuals who can go out and start these businesses. Now, we have kitchens, uh, commercial kitchens or programs available, but the funding to help some of these families start a business um, is lacking. Like that would be, a, that's a great way, a small, simple way uh, to kind of promote an industry. Um, so it's all about, about economics. I think we have to be creative in the way we provide services. And, and I hear from colleagues who represent rural areas of upstate New York, that one of the challenges is, um, and I believe this holds true for some of the owner offices, that you, you place the, the office or the services in one location, uh, but folks may live within miles of that and, and not have direct access. So I believe we need to tap into technology. I believe the state could look at infrastructure to our public library system, which exists in every, in every community, and provide the, the technological needs so that we can have webinars, legal services through webinars, or, or other, you know, formats that, that facilitate access to information. Um, and there's just so many little ideas like that that we want to kind of put together as a package and move forward with. I, the state of New York has always been the progressive state in this nation. That should not be a punchline. That should come back to be who we really are. And I think this is a great vehicle to drive that agenda, to show that we are innovative. And, and I know we've begun to, to do that. Um, great things are happening right now. Um, I wish we were more outspoken about the great things that we're doing. Uh, but I think it's important, and I think we're seeing a shift. The last thing I want to leave you with, my when we did the DREAM Act vote, um, we had very passionate discussions about that. I'm sure many of you probably heard what was said on the floor. But I'll tell you this, after the vote was done, several of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle came to me and expressed very personally um, an expression of, of uh, they basically said they were sorry. They basically said that was not the vote they wanted to take. It's not the vote they felt was right. But politically speaking, it was difficult to explain in their community and while that misunderstanding exists, they couldn't change their vote. And so that's an important thing because I respect and understand the political calculations they have to make. I get it. Um, and I'd rather that person make that political calculation and still remain the elected representative of that area so that we can work with individuals who get it and want to find them a, a different middle ground. But what it does speak to is that as we move forward as a coalition and as individuals do the work that they do, as we educate other New Yorkers about why this community is so vital and important to the future of this state, then I think we could break down some of those misunderstanding perceptions or barriers and get folks um, to loosen their views and to understand why it's important and hopefully bring us to a point where the DREAM Act isn't the only issue on the agenda, uh, but that we can really bring this community forward, incorporate them and, 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 and provide for the state and move the state forward economically, morally, and in every sense of the word and be that progressive state that we're so proud of being. Let me just add one thing that you, you, you may have done something else you didn't plan on. I didn't know about kitchen incubators. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You may not need money. You may come talk to me and we should do some... Uh... Tell you what, while we're at this, yeah. there's another idea. <laughs> and this one doesn't require a bill, though I do have a bill. Something simple. When we did the health exchange, when the changes happened with the Medicaid redesign, some of our legal service providers have, have said to me that they used to be able to call the health department and get a letter verifying an individual's eligibility for Medicaid. With the changes, there is somewhat of a, 
a pointing game going on where if you call the, some of the, uh, um, and these are folks who are providers who are saying, I believe this individual qualifies for the fee waiver, but I need to prove it. If they can show they're eligible for something like Medicaid, then that automatically makes them eligible for the waiver. Somebody in the legal field can correct me if I'm wrong. But what they used to be able to do is get a letter. They can't get that letter anymore because the health department says, well, you got to go to the insurance company. The insurance company says, no, you got to get that from the state. And when they have received something from the state, it looked almost like a fax that was put together by an intern somewhere. It, it just doesn't look official. It, it, and, some, and, and sometimes it's been returned because it's unclear that it's an official form. And it's helpful to the state because if more of these individuals are able to get the fee waiver and, and ultimately get their citizenship, then I believe their eligibility for services will come from federal dollars as opposed to state dollars. So it's a win-win for everybody and it's a simple administrative change that would go a long way. So I got bills for days, man. We can... But, you, but uh, you should come talk to me about a couple of those things. Well, something that uh, I, I failed to say because uh, I was rambling. Uh, one is uh, secure communities. Does everybody remember secure communities? Uh, New York State, I think, played an important uh, lead role, and and the other states started falling into line. I think uh, uh, my governor gets credit for that, as well as um, language access. Uh, we now uh, provide services in I think it's the seven top languages and, uh, prov and provide, uh, everything is translated into those languages. And I think this is something that happened within the first six months of, uh, of my coming on board as Secretary of State and, and it was due to the governor's leadership. Well, I want to thank you both for uh, setting the stage here and doing it in a very expeditious, on-time manner, giving us plenty of time for uh, about a half hour for questions. Now, what we do want, if you want to uh, ask a question, we have a microphone going around because we are uh, recording uh, this session. So uh, so please uh, identify yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Oh, sorry. Look at this. I'm not even uh, practicing what I'm preaching here, so I need to be at the mic. Um, so, uh, please, if you have any questions, and we'll bring the mic over to you. Who's going to ask the first one? Go ahead, Sarah. Hi, Sarah McElmurray with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Um, live in a state with many of the same challenges that both of you outlined. Thank you very much. I think what you refer to as upstate, we call downstate. That might be the only difference. <laughs> um, for Representative Crespo, um, when you were discussing the, the um, unsuccessful vote on the DREAM Act here in, in New York, um, mentioning that your colleagues had expressed remorse um, that they weren't able to properly explain the benefits of the legislation in their districts. Could you offer any other details on specifically some of those challenges? What other messaging or information might have been helpful for them to, uh, to make that case? Yeah, I, I think so much of the discussion around these issues, we have relied on passion and emotion and argued on the, I think, the, the morality of the issue, if we put it in those terms, right, for some of us who, who feel a certain way about it. Um, I think that people may have different uh, ideas about what that should be, but the one area where we all agree is that our economy is important and we all want an opportunity to live in a place where we can provide for our families and do well economically. And I think that it, argument is where we should speak more to, um, highlight the contributions of immigrant New Yorkers to the state, because there are perception. There are people who simply believe um, that immigrants come and take and get everything they want and they just got off a plane or, or a boat or cross the border and all of a sudden they're given an apartment and a job and a cell phone and, and meanwhile they're getting, literally, I've heard, this is what people will say. And so it's really about speaking to very openly um, and respectfully about the reality, about the numbers and what their contributions are, and, and helping provide that information. They're not going to give us a platform for that issue, but provide it. I'll give you an example of something we did. Uh, myself and four of my Democratic colleagues from the city of New York 
um, ha are very close friends with some of our younger Republican colleagues um, in the assembly, and and we did an exchange. We went to the southern tier of New York, and we visited we visited wineries, we visited dairy farmers, we visited uh, with uh, uh, their economic uh, council that they had, and they had representatives from colleges and local government, and we had a great exchange, and we talked about issues like the Safe Act and the impact of it. We talked about um, their concerns over the Farm Worker Bill of Rights and some of those issues, and we talked about the Dream Act and why it was important, um, and and to my my surprise that dialogue was a lot more open and understanding than I than I expected it to be. When you have a chance to just talk directly to folks, um, they put some of the politics aside, and they and they and they and I think they get it. And I and I just hope that we can help bring that message back. Politically speaking, we may not be welcome to do that, but we have to find creative ways of highlighting it and being proud of the contributions of this community. I think the state of New York and under the leadership of Governor Cuomo has created a platform through the owners, uh, through a number of the initiatives, being a leader on secure community and many of the other uh, initiatives. Um, the fact that he now champions uh, uh, the DREAM Act in his budget um, is an extre extremely important step. Whether we get it now or we get it next year, the reality is it's, it's trending in the right direction and we need that leadership uh, to begin to be proud of the contribution. And I think that's going to help change the message. Um, it's also going to change simply because demographics are changing and folks are moving out into new communities and, and being a big part of, of them economically as well, creating new businesses. And so that, that's important. The other last thing, when it was really interesting about that trip, before we ever brought any of these issues up, the, the dairy farmer brought up uh, the importance of those um, migrant workers and some who are undocumented who who without them their their farm would not survive and they were and they were not only sympathetic to the worker but to their families and their children um, the sa we heard the same thing at the wineries we, it, it, there was a sentiment from those that are economically important people in those communities saying this is an important community, an important population, and we are more than uh, hopeful that there is immigration reform federally, but if they can't get it right, we should do more to help these families. And, and that was a great message to hear, and I just hope we can create a platform for more people to understand that and hear that. Actually, if I, if I might follow up, and then if uh, others want to uh, ask questions, but um, in line with this, I, I was looking again uh, uh, for identifying folks. How about in the Senate? So is there, a similar kind of critical mass developing for support of Office for New Americans for uh, immigrant policy or uh, to, in a similar way, and even the same kinds of well, I'll tell uh, you what, outreach the, that, that the, we did. The Immigrant Service Enforcement Act passed overwhelmingly. I think we only had two votes in the Senate. Um, there are other bills out there that the Senate has been willing to move. They've the, the Dream Act became the political hot potato. The, the, it became fodder for them taking back the majority. And they've said very openly that they're not entertaining uh, that legislation in any way, shape, or form. Now, they can posture on that, or we, and we've had our conversations. And I'm hopeful uh, that with the leadership of Governor Cuomo, with the Speaker, and, um, and, and the leadership in the Senate, that they would you know, be open-minded. There are other bills that, that are being tied to a lot of this educa uh, educational discussion. Um, I, I'll, I'll be the eternal optimist because I have no choice in, in, in <laughs> policy, but you know what? I, I hope they can come around to it. Um, I know that uh, some of their members have have expressed that they would have a willingness to support this, but you know they're very they're they're, they're strong on their party line when it comes mm -hmm. to some of these controversial issues. So we'll see how it plays out. There's still some weeks left, and and I'm hopeful we can get it done. But but one issue in, in, in that you mentioned in terms of the form and being able to assist people to naturalize, that was part of our discussion earlier. Precisely that, because it's a sense of self-interest on the part of you know, anyone who, any taxpayer, in terms of thinking about shifting some of the costs back to the federal government, if you will, as opposed to the states. So, <laughs> the questions back here. We got two back here, so we need to come around and uh, we got, we'll take one and then two. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Lina Rincon from the University at Albany. I have a question for Secretary Perales. Yes. It's about the Office for New Americans. Uh, so you mentioned three things, three programs that you're focusing on. Uh, ESL languages, lang uh, teaching English uh, to immigrants, helping them start businesses, and also supporting them to natural naturalize. I'm wondering how do you choose which initiatives to focus on? Why do you choose these three programs? Uh, what's irrational to choose these programs rather than others? Thank you. Uh, I'd be lying if I said there was some sort of scientific way that we came up with these things. <laughs> uh, I mean, frankly, it came out of discussions with the governor, what he thought he wanted to do to facilitate 
the integration of new Americans into the state, the, the sense that uh, there was a, uh, an entrepreneurial spirit in the immigrant community that we were not tapping into. Um, so I think it's based on our own experiences, our own beliefs. Uh, before I started the Office for New Americans, I went on a listening tour and I went to uh, many uh, forums throughout the state, not just in, in New York City. And these were the, the themes that consistently came up. There were others. Uh, I remember one that had a lot of support was this idea of uh, focusing on uh, professional immigrants who could not uh, exercise their professions mm -hmm. here. But uh, it, it was a limit as to how much we could do. Although we do have a program that we do um, with Cooper Union, a university here, in which we do provide training for our professionals to get them licensed here. But all of this came out of our own experiences, my own experience, uh, and the listening tour that we undertook. Did she, was there another question there? I'm oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. And? Mm -hmm. oh, could you hold on a second? I'm just going to get the mic here. It's fine. Good afternoon. Anne Morris with the National Conference of State Legislatures. Nice to see you again, Silverman. Um, I think it's formidable that the executive and the legislature are working together. Um, I wish we could copy you across the United States. My question sort of follows from the last one. The group in this room really wants to replicate good examples. How do you find your inspiration for, for your proposals, and how do you share them with your peers in other states? Do you want to? Um, well, I mean, uh, frankly, uh, I have not had much of an opportunity to share them with, um, with other states. But my inspiration comes from, uh, I mean, like uh, my colleague here, I too was a, a child of an undocumented person at the time uh, I was born. She, she adjusted her status. That's a it's out of my bed. <laughs> but um, we, uh, I mean, one, one, one comes from where one comes from, as they say. Uh, and so the, the, my interest in, in immigrants has been uh, longstanding. Uh, it became uh, a passion as a civil rights lawyer when I saw what was going on. And uh, my interest was, as I explained before, uh, if I ever got into government, uh, we'd do things differently. Uh, and, and that's what, uh, what is going on. I don't know whether you, Assemblyman, have an opportunity to share with other states. Um, no, n not as much as I would like. And now um, I've been trying to participate more in some of the uh, national caucuses, so whether it's the Hispanic, uh, there's, there's several groups that I'm a part of. And it's just difficult time-wise, scheduling-wise. We're a full-time legislature for all intents and purposes. It's really difficult. To, and now with some of the other titles that, that uh, for me, it's been it's been a bit of a challenge, but but there is communication. We get a lot of um, information from advocates, from groups. So we have constant dialogue, and I know the secretary and and the second floor has has done the same in regards to keeping an open dialogue with with groups and advocates about what's important, what's needed, um, and looking at those specific nuances. Um, so, so ideas are out there. We love to have an opportunity to spend more time sharing those, but but they're out there. One of the things that I believe, just to throw this out there, that um, is going to help us develop better policies. Is better data collection on a number of a number of fronts. And um, uh, Dr. Dina Refke is someone I have worked with uh, regarding the immigration uh, in immigrant integration index. We've talked about uh, there's several bills out there that relate to data collection. That's, um, for example, in the Asian American community that breaks them down further than just Asian Americans into other subcategories. There are vast differences culturally and and other ways uh, uh, with some of the. Uh, subgroups within that. And so I just think better data collection across the board in state agencies is one area um, that could help us have the tools and, and, and have the right information to, to better draft some of our policy initiatives. Um, I know that wasn't the question, but I'm throwing it out there. <laughs> Got the secretary here. It, it, it is true, though, that we periodically get phone calls from other states, 
from uh, governor's offices elsewhere asking about what we do and how we do it. Well, uh, just to let you know that this morning we had a Skype call uh, from Marcos uh, Peterson at the governor's office in, in Illinois. And, uh, and in fact, he was actually asking Laura, and Laura reported on quite a bit, uh, so we had an exchange. And, and, and he was also very open to uh, follow up, so we may have some opportunities there. And in organizing this, I, I reached out and was just looking uh, for new Americans, you know, Google it <laughs> in different states, and, and found uh, a legislator, uh, the state Senate in, in Pennsylvania, who has introduced uh, a bill for an office of new Americans there. And I was also couldn't come, but very interested in, in what we're doing here. So I think there are a lot of people out there who are quite interested in, in what y'all are doing, and, uh, and I think we can develop a network, uh, particularly with some of the folks here, Michelle Waslin and uh, from Pew, and, um, and of course, Anne and, 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 and others to try to help make that happen. I think, I think Mayor de Blasio tried to bring other cities together. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably a little easier than doing statewide things, because there, there are a number of cities that are interested in doing mm -hmm. something about, uh, about their growing immigrant populations. Yeah. If I may yes. add, um, the National Integration Conference last year, you know, gather, it gathers every year. Oh, excuse me. Laura, can you hold on a sec? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Once again, the National Immigration Conference, which gathers, as you, all of you, I think, have at least been participants in, in the one last year, or most of you, it's going to be held this year in New York in New York City, and we're working to coordinate that also with the office in New York City. So that'll be something to keep a lookout for. But it's, an, it's a moment where we can exchange examples and learn from each other as well. So, any more questions? All right, in that case, I want to thank you both for joining us today, and we really uh, are inspired by the work that you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.